Oscar T. Moses here, senior pastor of Calvary Baptist Church, Salt Lake City, Utah. I want to welcome you to our WAR, W-A-R-E, Word of God Applied Rightly, Bible study. I had plans for another uh, lesson tonight, but of course, when I make plans, God laughs. And so uh, the intention was to begin a series entitled um, The COVID-19 Pandemic and the Urgency of Now. But uh, because of some other issues, we're going to put that on hold until next week. Speaking of next week, we have a, a host of talented people at Calvary Baptist Church, some of the most creative minds. And I have the opportunity to work with some of those people as they have creatively um, sought to bring our Facebook ministry alive or our social media ministry uh, through some different techniques that will reach the members in a creative way. And so uh, prayerfully next Tuesday, we'll come uh, live with the Bible study and uh, our team, uh, they're working feverishly to pull together some small groups and some leaders within that group. And we have some technical people on staff that know how to get the job done. So we're looking forward to uh, what's, what's happening during this season of creativity. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for this day and we thank you for grace and mercy. We ask that you would open our hearts up now to your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, I want to talk about something a little different today. I want to encourage you to get pencil and paper uh, to take notes. This is not a really exciting uh, jump up and down uh, lesson tonight, but it's more or less an informative lesson. And I pray that it doesn't put you to sleep, but that you would um, pay attention that you might learn something as a result. There. Uh, listen, today we are faced more than ever uh, with the challenge of confessing and standing on the word of God. As a matter of fact, the lines have been drawn in the sand and the church has been challenged to pick a side. Either we're going to stand on God's word or either we're going to conform to the world. The problem with this generation is that uh, they don't feel confident or this upcoming generation and they're strained from the church because we're not able to articulate or to defend the faith or stand on God's word. As a matter of fact, just thumbing through Facebook this past week, uh, so many jokes are made against the church and against preachers as it relates to how the church is responding during this time. But we believe that God's word is true and we believe in the trustworthiness of God's word. And so I want to answer the question this evening, can God's word be trusted? Is God's word reliable? I want to dig into some uh, some historical facts as it relates to the Bible, some bibliographical, bibliographical facts, as well as some archaeological facts that support uh, the trustworthiness of the Bible. Now, you might see me looking forth a couple of times at my timer because this thing is timed out on me a couple of times. So, I, you know, I created a couple of videos and I thought I was taping and I was just talking to a recorder that was not going on. So you're going to see me looking backwards and forth. And so pray for your pastor and let's look right at this lesson. You got to understand that uh, within the last 150 years, uh, there has arisen what's called the school of higher criticism uh, as it relates to the Bible. About 150 years ago, a German professor by the name of Bruno Bauer began to uh, deeply try to dismantle God's word. As a matter of fact, Bauer even said that Jesus Christ never existed and that uh, the gospels were a hoax and that it, they were just scriptures that were thrown together without any evidence. And so as a result of that, um, a whole school of thought started to derive uh, with, a era, with a bit of skepticism towards the Bible. And since that time, archaeology and um, geography and history has played a role, I believe, in confirming the trustworthiness of the Bible. I'm a former police officer, and I was taught in the police academy that at the end of the day, the only thing that matters are the facts. Just the facts, ma'am. Just the facts, sir. And so I want to look at the laws of, uh, the laws of evidence and try to support the claim and support the claim that God's word is trustworthy. Using the, the law of evidence, then <clears throat> we look at the Bible and ancient history. We look at the archeological findings that support the Bible and history and the ancient 
biblical manuscripts. First of all, let's give you a little information about the Bible and history. Um, the Bible um, has sold over 6 billion copies, over 100 million copies sold around the world uh, and given and more given away. And the, the thing about the Bible is that it has been burned, it has been banned, it has been banished. But the Bible, unlike some of the documents, has survived the test of time. It's like Energizer Buddy just keeps on going, keeps on going. No matter what history has tried to do to tort out the flame or 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 just annihilate the Bible, it, it has survived the test of time. Dr. Paul Myers is a historian and a professor at Western Michigan, and he gives some historical facts as it relates to the Bible and the timeline and history in which the Bible evolved to where it is right now. And he reminds us that the Bible was written over a period of 1500 years um, from 1400 BC to uh, 100 AD. And it was written by more than 40 different writers written in three different languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. Um, <clears throat> the first copy of the Bible from its original form was the Septuagint, which was translated from uh, a Greek translation from the Old Testament around the third century BC. And its present form, it has 66 books, uh, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament. Uh, I'm going to try to skip through some of this. Um, it was in 1488 that a rabbi named Isaac Nathan divided the Old Testament into verses. Uh, the Pilgrim's Bible came in 1455. In 1522, Martin Luther uh, brought the Greek translation. Uh, he transferred the German and the Greek into the German Bible. In uh, 1525, William Tinsdale uh, later was captured, strangled, and burned for uh, creating the English translation. Uh, the first English translation of the Bible divided into chapters and verses was in 1560. It was brought by the pilgrims uh, that came to America 50 years later, the King James Version, which people um, have uh, more copies of the King James Version has been sold than any other copies. Copy. Since the King James Version, over a thousand different translations or thousands of translations have been have been uh, have been copied and so here's my point the printing press uh, was able to assure um, consistent cop uh, accuracy of copies or reliabilities in the copies so let's look at the standard of reliability the standard of reliability is what made uh, the Bible or copies reliable and accurate or pass the test in order to 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 be uh, considered a Bible. And so for all of those Bibles that I mentioned or whatever, uh, the New Test, I mean, the New Living Translation, um, King James, the New King James Version, or what the Message Bible, it has to pass what's called a standard of reliability test. And <clears throat> the first test is the bibliography test. The second test is the internal evidence. And the third test is the external evidence. So if we look at the 66 Bibles, 66 books of the Bible, um, we're not going to do that. Let's just examine the four books of the gospel, the gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew was a gospel written to a Jewish audience, uh, Mark to the Roman audience, Luke to the Greek audience, and John was written to the larger Christian world, to the world. Matthew uh Mark and Luke are seen, are called synoptic gospels, synoptic, S-Y-N-O-P-T-I-C. And that word synoptic means that they're seen together. They gave their accounts of Jesus from their own perspective, but they all coincide and collaborate. And so they're called synoptic gospels, whereas John is considered the aoptic gospel, seen alone, because John pinpoints the Christology or the study of Christ. So given that, let's look at the Gospels and see if they are reliable. And the first test that we do that we use to measure the Gospels is the bibliography test. And the bibliography test uh, simply answers this question. Was the Gospels written close to the time of the actual events when Matthew, Mark and Luke, John wrote about Jesus? How close was that event from the time that they actually wrote it? And then number two, how many copies were made available 
for comparison. So that's critical that you understand that in the standard of reliability, the, the bibliography test, that the question is asked, how close was the event from the time that the person wrote it and how many copies were available since that, uh, since that event was um, written? So if we look at Dr. Paul Meyer, who was a professor of um, history in, <clears throat> at Western Michigan, <clears throat> He talks a lot about <clears throat> um, different authors in antiquities or bodies of work in antiquity or in history that have been considered reliable uh, even before the Gospels were written. But listen to what he has to say. He does a survey and he finds out that, uh, for example, that there are secular authors outside of the Bible that we find a vast difference in timeline in which they wrote and the number of copies that that's different from the Bibles. Let me let me get it to give it to you this way. For example, Plato, the great philosopher, uh, died in 347 BC. And yet his first manuscript we have in the 10th century AD, some 1200 years after his death. Uh, look at Herodotus, the father of history, who died in 425 BC. And yet the oldest of his work is not documented until 1300 years after his death. And there are only eight copies uh, available for comparison. The writings of Julius Caesar and his copies of the Gallic Wars only have 10 copies and they are dated some 1000 years after his death. Aristotle's oldest work is dated 1400 years after his death. And there are only 49 copies. We have, um, we have a span of 1,000 years to 1,400 years when these works were written, and there are minimal copies today. But let's look at the Gospels and see how they pale or how they compare to those uh, writings I just talked about. Um, the three Gospels, um, there are three Gospels that were written, watch this, 30 years after the death of Christ. Three Gospels written 30 years after the death of Christ. The, the time between the original document and the earliest written copies is less than any, any other ancient manuscript in history. The number of manuscripts available for the Bible in comparison are 6,000, 6,000 copies for comparison, and the numbers continue to grow. Homer's Iliad is the only ancient book in history that even comes close to the Bible. His, his closest, his, 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 let me see, it was written 800 years before Christ. Iliad had 600 copies. There's only one book that has more copies than him, and that's the Bible. Nothing in history comes close to accuracy as it relates to manuscript or literature than the Bible as, as, as it comes to real reliability, and that's called textual criticism. Now, concerning the copies of Scripture, there are some that are not in the copies that, that are not completely accurate. But let me make this clear. There is nothing, and I, 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 I repeat, nothing uh, that violates the basic doctrine of Christian belief or of Christian faith. There is no other work of ancient writings that come close to the biblical historical evidence and trustworthiness of the New Testament. The second test is the internal test of the Gospels. We gave you the bibliographical test, and that's we compared other writings, their copies in the time frame in which they were written to the Bible, and the Bible comes out uh, written within 30 years, over 6,000 copies, and the numbers continue to grow and grow. That gives it accuracy and reliability. But the internal test of the scriptures is answers the question, did the writers uh, mean have the means or opportunity uh, to get the story right? Were they able to collaborate on the story? And the internal uh, God, uh, message of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, suggest that they were collaborating. They collaborated in their, in their eyewitness account. And you got to ask yourself, are there obvious contradictions in the work? Were there eyewitnesses or close associates of the eyewitness that confirm the events uh, or not? For instance, um, uh, Luke, Luke uh, was not an apostle, but he was there during the time and after the time of Jesus and was able to collaborate their work. Let me move on. Um, 
Let's look at the external evidence test for the gospel. Uh, that's outside sources. Now, as Christians, we can say, well, this is the Bible and other Christians will agree with me. And we will say, these are the events that happen. But what gives it more strength is that when people outside of Christendom or even Judaism can confirm and collaborate some of the stories that are present in the Bible. For instance, uh, for a long time, there was no historical evidence um, of people even being crucified in Judea. And so many scholars begin to tear that apart and say, you know, that uh, history or outside sources said that when people were crucified, they would have not been given uh, an elaborate funeral. There would be no tomb because a common criminal would be thrown to the dogs for the dogs to eat. And so all of that theory was debunked in 1968 uh, while building on an apartment in North uh, Jerusalem. And they came across, an, across what's called an ossuary or a bone box. And in that bone box, they found the bones of a young man, perhaps in his 20s. And in his foot was a seven inch nail that was connected to an olive tree and which debunked the whole theory that people that were crucified were thrown all through the to the dogs. There were some people that were crucified that were given elaborate burials. And there's also uh, external evidence that supports uh, Jesus Christ and supports Christians and support the church. So here it is. <clears throat> there are two outside sources that are Roman, not even Jewish. Uh, you have the Jewish historian uh, Josephus, but you have Roman historians such as Tacitus, and uh, Suetonius. And although Suetonius talks briefly about the events that happened around the resurrection, Tacitus speaks more explicitly to it. As a matter of fact, T Tacitus refers to uh, Christians being thrown to the lions. He, he refers to the burning of Rome and how Nero um, persecuted Christians. He, this is an outside source of, of Christian writings. Uh, Tacitus reports how Nero persecuted Christians and he blamed Christians for the great fire. And uh, Tacitus reports how Christians were burned and lying uh, through Nero's uh, walkway uh, as candles and how we were persecuted in that way. So you have 30 years within Jesus' death that outside sources collaborate, uh, collaborate with what has been said I'm back and there's probably a change in the quality of the picture, but I had to switch from the iPhone kept cutting off to uh, the iPad with less um, of the quality that you might get. Anyway, so I left off on, um, you, ha you have 30 years within Jesus' death that people, our followers of, followers of Christ are still documenting uh, the actual um, historical account of Jesus. The third piece of evidence is uh, Pliny the Younger. Pliny the Younger, uh, the external evidence, Pliny the Younger was uh, uh, a governor in Bithynia and an Asia Minor around uh, 110 AD. And uh, we have several letters that are preserved from Pliny the Younger that mentions uh, the problem. And the problem that he's talking about is the problem of the Christians. He calls Christians the problem. And he makes references to uh, the Christians that are worshiping uh, Christ. And he even makes reference that they are calling this Christ God, uh, a divine being. And this is from an outside source uh, some 50 years after the resurrection. Pliny the Younger said, makes the mention of the problems of the Christians gathering, uh, worshiping this deity. He historically writes down uh, that they are uh, having a, a supper, which was the Lord's Supper, and that they were going over the, Lord, uh, the, the Ten Commandments. And so the Gospels are deemed, um, or if the Gospels are deemed unreliable uh, based on this evidence, then how do we look at the writings of Julius Caesar Plato, Aristotle, they all crumble under the weight of the evidence found that supports the Bible as being a reliable source. Dr. Randall uh, Price um, is a professor out of California, out of California. Uh, 
uh, San Diego, California, at Veritas Seminary. And um, he talks about uh, the excavation of the Dead Sea Scrolls or the come run file, files that were discovered in 1948. The Dead Sea Scrolls are uh, ancient Bible and other texts that um, from, from around the time uh, of, of Christ. Uh, they would have been in leather. They would have been written in ink, which was called soot. They would have been in papyrus, written on papyrus, which was originally from Egypt, but also found in Israel. Uh, Price makes the, no the notation that Job would have been the oldest book of the Bible, um, stating back that that goes back to around 1500 B.C. And the last book in the Old Testament would have been uh, Malachi, around 400 B.C. And so he, he lifts up that during those 1100 years, those documents, in order to uh, maintain their accuracy over 1100 years, they would have had to been written over and over and over again. But they had to all say the same thing. And so um, in in uh, the, my research, I discovered this guy by the name of Joel Lamb. Joel Lamb is a manager and a curator of the Bible Museum in Goodyear, Arizona. And he talks about how these copies have been preserved over the years. Um, Joel Lamb says that skeptics assume that given the amount of time between the original document and the oldest copy, copy there must be hundreds if not thousands of errors between 1100, uh, 1400, 1500 BC and 400 BC. He says there has to be countless of errors if they were copying them over and over again. But Lamb says you have to understand the process in which scriptures were preserved. Uh, in the Hebrew, uh, there was called a scribe. A scribe was the person who wrote the scriptures over and, you know, copied the, and copied and recopied the, the, uh, the word so much until they knew about memory. Sophers is what they were called. And so he says, uh, he talks about the scribes and, and their methods um, and how their methods were astounding because they were so accurate in copying the scriptures and over and over again. Um, around the seventh century, a group of scribes called the Masoretes had to copy the original page with such accuracy that the number of words on the page could not be changed. Each line, each line uh, on a new page had to be exact the same as the original. If the, if the first line on the original page had nine lines, the copy had to match that. The number of letters were counted and compared with the, with the original. Another scribe would check what the middle word was on the copy and it had to match the original. The scribes were not allowed to copy sentence for sentence or even word for word. They had to copy letter for letter. And after it was copied and checked by another, a third person would check to see what the middle word was on the page. And when that process was done, another would count the phrase. How accurate uh, were they in copying the, copying the Old Testament? Well, up until 1940, 1947, the oldest manuscript from the Old Testament came from around 1000 AD uh, from the Masoretic text. The product of a group of scholars called the Masoretes, uh, they took on the responsibility of making sure that the books of the Old Testament were preserved for future references. And so, you know, you ask how accurate was it? Scholars assume that the Masoretic text uh, had hundreds of errors until one day, um, uh, in the 20th century, um, 1948, a uh, little boy had a rock and was throwing a rock into a cave and it, it hit a jar and it broke a jar, a clay jar in the cave. And that rock struck pottery um, with 37 jars of scrolls of parchment were, uh, which contained every book of the Old Testament with the exception of the book of Esther. And um, from, from one of those 11 caves came a complete copy of the book of Isaiah. 
And when they compared those copies that were thousands of years old with the Masoretic text, they found out that it was 95% accurate. The Masoretic writings were over a thousand, a thousand years from the copies they found. The most important biblical, that was the most important biblical find in history because those texts showed the accuracy of scripture. The second thing is archaeological findings that support the Bible. There have been accusations that the Bible uh, cannot be trusted because it makes references to events and cities and locations that we don't know where they are anymore. Uh, and their conclusion is that um, the absence of outside Bible corroboration must mean the Bible is in error. But what if there is evidence that there has not yet been discovered? Archaeology is about discovering. It's about discovering evidence of what happened in the past through excavation to reconstruct the events of history. Excavation has confronted the world of the Bible as true. King David, in the Bible, uh, King David, the ancestor of Jesus, is mentioned numerous times, uh, over a thousand times. No historical evidence outside of Christian, biblical, or Jewish history um, until a discovery at Tel Dan, Israel in 1993. Archaeologist Avram Biram discovered a site uh, which contained a monumental dedicatory inscription which was written on the salt stone and the two pieces that were found in ins an inscription written by Arameans, one of the enemies of Israel. They came from Damascus uh, and King Hazel was their leader. It describes a war between Israel and Aramaeans, between Israel and Aramaeans, where the Aramaeans were victorious. They referred to the conquered king of Israel of the house of David. Because it is written by an enemy, you can't accuse Israeli of propaganda. This is written by an enemy. If there was a house of David, if there was a house of David, there had to be a David. Am I right? So here's another point. Pontius Pilate, the, uh, the judge that condemned Jesus, was doubted until 1962 when archaeologists found a stone uh, inscription that said, To the people of Caesarea, Pontius Pilate, the prefect of Judah, has presented the Tiberium in honor of Emperor Tiberius. It's hard evidence from the ancient world that Pontius, Pilus, Pontius Pilate existed. What was the other side of the bar with Pilate? What was on the other side of the bar with Pilate? High priest Joseph Caiaphas, the chief prosecutor, Caiaphas, bones were discovered in 1990 in ossuary with his name on the side. With these two men, you have the judge and the prosecutor of Jesus on Good Friday showing up in, archae in archaeological discoveries. It is said among the scholars that archaeology is the best friend that Christians have because of overwhelming discoveries that line up with the Old and New Testament. Here's the thought. Some people hold the reliability, hold the reliability of the text of the Bible to a higher standard than other ancient documents. That makes sense. Plato offers us philosophical ideas. Caesar gives us historical information. An ancient playwriter gives us amusement, but the Bible speaks claims for God. It should be held to a higher standard. The last argument that I have is the ancient biblical manuscript, and we're done. It's one thing to say the text is reliable, but the question is, is the text true? Is God speaking? What is he saying? The focus of the Bible is on a central character and a central event in that person's life, Jesus Christ. The central event is his death and resurrection. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 and 17, if Christ has not been risen from the dead, our faith is in vain. If Christ has not been risen from the dead, let us eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Brothers and sisters, our hope as we come upon the resurrection season, our hope is in the resurrection. And the gospel contains the count of Jesus' life, 
his burial, and his resurrection. And by the bibliographical and the internal and external evidence, we see that his story, history confirms that there were eyewitnesses. The Gospels say that Jesus claimed that he was the Son of God, the Messianic figure from the Old Testament. He also claimed he would die and rise, be risen from the grave. That This was the claim of the Old Testament. What did Jesus say about the scriptures? Jesus said about the Old Testament on the road of Emmaus in Luke 24, uh, verses 25 and 26. Then he said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and enter into his glory? Jesus validates the Old Testament. Jesus talked about Old Testament figures in Luke 24 and 44. And he said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Psalms 119, 89. Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Joshua 1, 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do all according to all that is written. For then you will make your way prosperous. And then you will have success. Luke 16, but it is easier for heaven. It is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one stroke of the letter of the law to fulfill. Faith in the Bible. God's word is reliable. It's rooted and grounded in historical events and places, many of which we can point to today. In closing, faith is, um, is based on the fact that we're able to find some hard evidence in archaeology, as I've given to you, in history, uh, confirming the Bible. This is evidence that truly demands a verdict, one that affects the juror. You, you can't sit back, analyze the evidence, and say, Jesus did live, die, and was buried from the grave, and then just go about your business. If you've looked at it and you studied it and you know that Jesus lives, then you have an obligation. And our obligation is to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Christians believe that the Bible is a record of everything God has done to win humanity back to himself. In order to repair what's wrong, what went wrong with the relationship between God and man. God sends his own son to make right what was wrong. The death and resurrection of Jesus is the single most important event in the Bible. And it demands a verdict. It demands a response from you and I. God's word is true. I'm done, but uh, in 1998, uh, investigative reporter Lee, Stro Lee Strobel, who was at one time an atheist, uh, wrote a book called The Case for Christ, where he gave reliable uh, historical documentation that Jesus lived, uh, that he was resurrected. But since that time that he wrote that book in 1998, a whole bunch of skeptics and critics came out to try to dismantle the fact that Jesus Christ lived, died, was buried and resurrected. In 2007, the Discovery Channel launched a series uh, called The Lost Tomb of Jesus, which disputed the resurrection. They went in hard. They disputed it. And then there was another book that came out called The, the Jesus Family Tomb, which made this ri ridiculous claim that Jesus was not crucified and that he had a family and that his bones was discovered along with his family by a construction crew in 19, a construction crew in 1990. And then more recently, Muslims who understand that the resurrection is everything to us are now even more trying to dismantle the resurrection of Christ. But the Muslims are not alone. Hindu, a Hindu leader, uh, also declared in 2007 that Jesus never died on the cross and he somehow survived the crucifixion and that he later moved to India where he died. But the Hindus and the Muslims are not alone. Atheists have come out 
2005, Prometheus Books, they promoted a 545-page page anthology called The Empty Tomb, or Jesus Beyond the Grave, in which skeptics and, and atheists go forth and say that Jesus never existed or he was never buried. But what's so outrageous and disgraceful at the same time is those of us that call themselves, I call ourselves Christians, have become, have become gullible to the attacks of skeptics and, and all of those tricks that try to pull us away from the word of God. And all of a sudden, it seems like 2,000 years of systematic theology is going down the drain. And, and now we're reading books like The Da Vinci Code, The Lost Book of Thomas. Somebody was mentioning the other day, The Book of Mary. And I have no problem with reading those books. The only problem that I have as it relates to Christians is that We've read the Da Vinci Code. We've read the Lost Book of of um, of Thomas. We've read um, uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Every book we've read, except for the Bible, we have not read God's Word. And so that's my prayer that we would study God's Word and that we would know that it is God's inspired Word, His truth. And that we believe that God's word is true. Our Father, we thank you for this day. This was long. And God, I just pray that someone, if one person was helped, then heaven will be glorified. And we give you glory, honor, and praise right now as we pray for the world in which we live. We pray, oh God, for... We pray, God, for a healing in the land. We pray that you would heal the land, Lord. Not just... Uh, from coronavirus, but we pray for healing. We pray for those doctors and we pray for those scientists and those who are working to try to bring about a vaccination. We pray for first responders. We pray for those who've been affected by the, uh, in, by the virus and infected, infected and affected by the virus. We pray for family members who are going uh, to you in prayer and praying for the healing of loved ones. We pray for healing but we also pray for revival. We pray, oh God, that our relationship with you will become stronger and stronger and that we will be restored in our rightful place as your people. And that we pray that this gospel, this glorious gospel uh, that you have given us, that we would spread it throughout the land, that you might be glorified, the saints might be strengthened, the sinners might be saved. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.